Hello class and welcome to our study on the book of Romans, an exciting study that wraps up our four books on soteriology, dealing with salvation. Of course, the theme of these four books is the atonement process of Christ and how he brings sinful man into the presence of a holy father, uh, making us at one, atonement at one with God. Now, Hebert gives us a timeline which is uh, worthy of following. The J Jerusalem Council in 50 AD is the, uh, the famous meeting where the discussion of Gentiles' role in salvation was considered. In the book of Galatians, uh, faith um, similar to the faith of Abraham was demonstrated by grace through faith. Are you saved? First uh, Corinthians uh, addresses inappropriateness of people who call themselves Christians. Uh, there should be a demonstrated life change. In Second Corinthians, Paul had to defend his character as a preacher of the gospel because that's what the enemy was attacking. And then we get to a whole different tone, the book of Romans. Romans is certainly the most quoted book when we're considering the plan of salvation. And in this, we find it very um, unusual for the writings of Paul. He is not addressing any issues or concerns uh, with a church, specifically the Church of Rome here. But instead, he very calmly presents uh, the plan of salvation by faith and addressing man's need. Um, this group, this listing, makes up the majority of Paul's letters. In the book of Romans, again, the style of writing is very calm. It is a very intelligent uh, dissertation of explaining man's need for salvation. And uh, most of us are familiar with some form of the Romans road. And also in Romans 12, where we are reminded that a life surrendered, a life transformed is a good and, and it will demonstrate the perfect will of God. And it's what we've been called to do. So with these passages that I've selected, uh, it's sort of to remind people not only do we live it from the inside out, a holy sacrifice, but we explain it in a very logical way. Look at Romans Road, the, uh, the verses that are selected here. He starts with a problem. There's none righteous. He amplifies the problem. All have sinned. He gets the listener's attention by uh, explaining that God has made a solution to the problem. And he further explains that in Romans 6.23, explaining that the wages of our sin is death, but God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Verses, uh, chapter 10, verses 9 through 10, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord, again, that is kurios, that is our king. If we'll confess him as our king. And believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. And of course, part of that, we have a king in Jesus. He was raised from the dead. And what's implied here is the understanding of the purpose. Why did we need a Savior? Why was Jesus considered to be the Savior? And how does this fit in God's plan of making sinful humans perfect in his eyes? and that only Jesus could fulfill what God the Father stipulated as a condition of entering heaven, and the stipulation of entering heaven is having no sin to your account. Not a few sins, but no sin to your account. And as he gave the illustration by sacrifices in the Old Testament, he recognizes a vicarious sacrifice of Jesus' his Son, and that is the only substitute that he will accept worthy of your sins being transferred unto Jesus's account therefore making the 
legal account, if you will, in the courtroom of heaven of sinful man sinless because they've been transferred. And that is the case just because God the Father said so. So with that in mind, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you understand the progression of what's said here, it's not an easy believism by any stretch of the imagination. It's understanding the salvation process, understanding that God instituted it. That's why it's acceptable. It's understanding that only Jesus and Jesus alone uh, is the only acceptable uh, substitute and that any other plan of going to heaven is in competition of what Jesus has done. And when one would recognize this and say, after considering this, then I call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and Jesus alone, then a person is saved. Here's a, a picture of um, Rome as uh, an artist has illustrated it. And that illustration comes from looking at the Roman, uh, the ruins that are still in Rome today. The Romans were known for ruling by intimidation. Everywhere you look, you see uh, signs of conquering other nations. As a reminder of the people, uh, we will squash you if you rise up against us. The city of Rome has an estimated population between 1.2 and 4.1 million people at its heyday. Uh, only somewhat half of those were free citizens. Uh, Rome, of course, is the capital of the Roman Empire, and it's the largest and most important city of the world at that time. Rome was experiencing its better days during the time of uh, Paul's writings, um, at the earlier writings, that is. Under the days of Nero, they were very successful. There was also a large population of Jews that were there as a result of Pompey taking Jerusalem uh, in 63 BC. The Jews were slaves, but they were terrible slaves. They constantly had rules that they wouldn't violate, whether they were Orthodox Jews and they would rather die than violate the laws of Moses, or whether they just used them as an excuse, they were not really worth the effort. So lots of times uh, there was a negotiated or a manu, uh, manumitted uh, release if they would cooperate and then work and buy their freedom. Uh, Jews made terrible slaves. As far as the morals and religion of Rome goes, while the government had its share of corruption, the rule of the city was generally good. It was a safe city because uh, the, ru the rulers would not tolerate um, any type of uh, rebellion or violence or theft. Um, under Nero, Judaism and synagogues flourished. He used religion as a means of appeasing and controlling the people. But he did that not only with Judaism, he did that with uh, most religions. Polytheism and heathen religions had become contentious, though. They had been allowed to grow and prosper and to reveal just how uh, inappropriate, how wrong that they were. Um, but at the same time, um, monotheistic religions like that of the Jews was um, allowed to prosper and grow as well. The synagogues had achieved a considerable Gentile following. Uh, the Gentiles had a degree of sympathy for the Jews that uh, when they would be overthrown or taken captive. So um, those who had come to have, uh, at least to some degree, an appreciation for the Jewish people, uh, and they were God-fearers looking for truth, they became fertile ground for the gospel in Rome. When Paul wrote this gospel, the church had been in operation for some time. Paul felt the church was sufficiently strong enough to assist him in his future Western ministry to Spain. If you'll recall, um, the Roman Empire was very large, and Rome was in the center. And as we study Paul's uh, earlier travels, 
he was working solely in the eastern half of the Roman Empire between the Greece, Macedonia, and the uh, Israel. And Paul had a desire, as he explained in um, 15 verse 24, he had a desire to go to Spain. That would have been uh, the extreme western edge of the Roman Empire. And he felt like the church in Rome would be a perfect base for him to operate out of. It appears as though this church met in several houses. Uh, while there was a large Jewish representation in the church, there does not seem to be any anti-Pauline mindset. So the Judaizers had not really progressed as far west as Rome in trying to um, cause problems for Paul. Many of Paul's staunchest supporters in this church were Jewish Christians. Now, the views on the origin of the church uh, in Rome, well, the Roman Catholic view claims that Peter traveled there and that Peter established the church. Now, if that be the case, Paul makes no mention of him. Or maybe the result of starting the church in Rome was uh, out of Pentecost. Maybe there were Roman Jews in Pentecost, yet the church is mostly Gentile. So if you were going to argue that there was a movement from uh, Israel uh, to start the church in Rome, then it would have been a better argument to say it was the household of Cornelius, for he was a Roman centurion, and once he was saved, um, shortly after um, Peter, of course, um, saw the uh, sheet come down uh, while he was in Joppa, and then he went to Caesarea to meet with Cornelius. Um, you can imagine how that would have had a ripple effect through the military all the way back to Rome. However, Hebert has a better point of view. Hebert believes that most likely, as families were traveling, uh, families were migrating toward the metropolis of the empire, which would have been Rome, um, as individual families that had been discipled and churched through churches where Paul had uh, established churches in the east, they would come across each other, and as they come uh, across each other and recognize their common bond and their love for Christ, they would begin to associate together. And that seems like the most logical uh, formation of the church, since we have no specified uh, information about how the church started. Paul says the church was universally famous. Uh, Paul recognized that the church had different gifts and that they were able to admonish one another, what he had been trying to teach the, uh, the Christians in Corinth. Um, the list of names in Romans 16 indicates the church was made up of free men and slaves. And according to Tacius, uh, by AD 64, the, Rome, the Christians in Rome had grown to an immense multitude. So certainly, it was a thriving uh, church that had uh, a, a means to do much. They were very blessed. Rather than uh, addressing any internal conditions uh, at the Church of Rome, Paul was writing this letter due to his the development of his own plans. He desired, as we'd mentioned before, to inaugurate his ministry in the West, as described in Acts 19.21. Now, as soon as he delivered the collection to Jerusalem, he intended to head to Spain via Rome. Don't forget, he is on his, as we'll explain here in a minute, he's on his third uh, missionary journey. He is gathering up a collection, a love gift to the struggling saints in Jerusalem. He intends to deliver that and remind them that the Gentile churches love the saints in Jerusalem because of how God has used them. And uh, after he does that, he intends to change directions and head toward the West, developing a whole new uh, frontier, if you would, where the gospel has not been preached. Paul loved going places where other people had not yet established uh, a ministry or a church. So, let's talk about Paul and his writing of this letter. 
Hebert stresses that the letter was written from Corinth during the third missionary journey. Here's his logic. He has not yet visited Rome. He wrote this letter to the Romans before he had ever visited the church. He has not yet delivered the collection to Jerusalem. So you've got an upper limit on the time frame. The reference of his connection to Felix in Acts 24 makes it certain he uh, it was raised during the third missionary journey because that's when Felix became involved. So there's a bottom limit of the time frame. It was somewhere between delivering the collection of Jerusalem and after he had met with um, Felix. All these points, all these events, point to Paul being in Corinth during the last three months of his third missionary journey. The tranquil atmosphere of the message suggests something else, that it was written after Paul had been in Corinth for a while. If you remember, 1st and 2nd Corinthians was pretty stressful for Paul. But once he did arrive at Corinth, and it appears as though uh, the sin had been dealt with and the church was thriving again, that calm atmosphere may have had a contribution to why he was able to write such a calm letter to the Romans, a calm letter that went into great depth of doctrine and laid out a very logical plan for salvation. The plans for Phoebe to travel indicates that the navigation season would be opening soon, and that would open at the end of winter, somewhere around March 10th. So, here's Paul's schedule again. Paul intended to travel to Corinth, uh, from Corinth to Jerusalem. But Acts 20 describes a plot by the Jews, thus he changed his plans and traveled through Macedonia instead. Paul left for Jerusalem from Philippi during the Easter season of A.D. 58. Therefore, the epistle was written in the early months, possibly February of A.D. 58. Now, while a lot of that is conjecture and it's through the process of inductive reasoning. This slide is as clear as could be possibly understood. The purpose of the book of Romans is not at all in doubt or in question. He has missionary plans. He desired to make Rome his base of operations in the West as he had used Antioch back in the East. Now, he never leaves his desire to encourage the churches in the east, uh, where he is based out of Antioch, but he's just ready to expand to a new area. Apparently that meant that the churches were able to grow, and the Lord was going to use the leadership of those uh, pastors and missionaries in the east, and he was ready to duplicate that process in the west. So, um, Paul desired to win the church, win the hearts of the people of the church at Rome as the basis for his universal gospel. He has sought to bring together the union of Gentiles and Jews in the gospel. This purpose was the underlying reason for the Gentile offering to the Jews that he was taken back to Jerusalem. Now with that in mind, he was seeking prayer support. Paul was concerned about his upcoming trip to Jerusalem and concerned about the hatred and the reaction of unbelieving Jews. Well, his concern was well-founded, for as we know, um, he was imprisoned, and things changed after that. So um, his prayer was well-founded. He gave them, to a lesser degree, warnings against the errors and practices of not living um, a godly main point that we get out of the book of Romans was there was a, a theological formation. The doctrine of salvation for all generations was laid out. It's almost as though he was making a presentation to a church as though missionaries today are on deputation and they come and they share a burden with the church and then we hear them preach and they share their passionate plea for salvation and that way the church that's being invited to support them 
that church knows exactly what they're going to preach and what they're going to demonstrate when they go out on the mission field. And I truly believe that that's what Paul is doing. He is in a written form giving them the message of good news salvation that he's going to give to the western half of the empire and would they like to be part of propagating this message. Now, of course, the side effect is all of us now have a documented record of this uh, letter, which is uh, the basis of uh, much of what we come to understand and stand upon in the doctrines of soteriology. Most of Paul's writings, um, this is the most formal of Paul's writings, a remarkable contrast to the casual style of Galatians where he was uh, just in a very warm uh, way he was uh, explaining how they had their faith available as demonstrated through the faith of Abraham. Um, this is not a personal letter but it is more of a rational argument uh, of explaining the problem with mankind and a solution that God has given. That's why it's considered doctrinal. It is one of the finest pieces of logic ever penned, uh, according to Hebert, and uh, as this professor, I agree. Uh, there's universal applications. It's composed in Greek rather than Rome's Latin, an indication that the letter was intended for this universal application. Uh, there are references to the oneness of mankind and the sin of Adam, Likewise, full salvation is offered to all. Consequently, there are resultant duties for those who believe. There are more Old Testament quotations in Romans than in any of the other epistles. As a matter of fact, all of them combined. Now, as far as the influence, together with Galatians, Romans is the basis of the Protestant Reformation. Look at the, the commonality between the two. The Gauls were reminded, you don't have to be a second-class citizen. You don't have to come through the hierarchy of the church. You don't have to be looked down upon. God's not a respecter of persons. All are invited to come boldly to the throne of grace. And Romans is just more of a technical, um, formal explanation of how that process works. Romans is the basis of uh when the fathers of the Reformation period, when uh, Martin Luther and Calvin and others that stood up against the hierarchy of the church in Rome, they used uh, the doctrines that we see especially in Romans of demonstrating that the papacy truly was not uh, a necessity of knowing and having a relationship with Christ but that each man could come and ask for forgiveness directly without the need of a human priest. Now, there, uh, there is some difficulty in Romans, and we're going to touch upon this lightly here. And it's similar to the argument about 2 Corinthians, and it's this, the lack of unity in the letter. Um, some of the writings of antiquity do not include the last two chapters. However, none of the known manuscripts leave these out. None of the existing known ones do. Now, there is some variation in manuscripts as to the location of the final doxology that uh, we have uh, in our Bibles listed as chapter 16 verses 25 to 28. But there, there are some variations in the manuscripts and that cannot be uh, denied. So we have to look at when we see variation in manuscripts, we ask ourselves the question, what does that really mean? Does it, um, does it challenge the validity of the book? Well, no, it just questions the means or the mode of the scribes and how they chose to uh, transmit it on through the generations. The better question is, is um, does any of the variation in the manuscripts, does it change the intent of the doctrine? And the good news is this. No, 
Uh, even with all the variations, which again proves that man didn't somehow sanitize the manuscripts and there's not some big coordinated effort to try to trick everybody through the generations as uh, Hollywood movies would have you to believe. Um, instead, the variations that were allowed to stand because there's not a massive scale cover-up. And when we look at the variations through human error, none of the variations change the doctrine, the, the theological points of the book, which really gives the book more credibility because it has not been used to deceive. So here's, here's something that uh, we want to be familiar with, even though I don't necessarily have the answers to it, but there appears to be four places that were good stopping points um, for the book of Romans. We see uh, the Amen prayer that looks like it's a closing prayer on four different applications, as I have listed here. Now, what does that mean? In four different locations, it looks as though he's closing uh, the letter. And one justification of this, I could explain, um, has that ever happened to us before when we are teaching or preaching and we get to a point of wrapping it up, but yet there's one more solid point that we want to make. And granted, an oratory uh, is not the same thing as having a written letter, certainly. But just because there are uh, good places that it appears as though uh, the epistle could have ended, that doesn't question the integrity of it. But it does allow some to argue maybe some scribes added uh, some of these other verses from other items after the original uh, letter was written. Maybe there's some other good points that they wanted to add on there, more or less like a commentary to the letter. Well, then we go back and we ask ourselves the same question. With any of these variations, with any of these endings, if you took any of the endings out, would it change the meaning of the letter? Would it change the doctrine? Would it change uh, the impact on the plan of salvation? And the answer is no. All of these are merely supporting statements. So if that's what they are, uh, maybe that's what he was doing. He was driving home the point uh, four different times. He's driving home the point that this is, this is true, this is valid, this is valuable over and over and over again. So as we close this study on the book of Romans, it's certainly an exciting book because this is the book we should go to. This book and the other three books of soteriology, especially the book of Galatians, if we're going to talk to somebody or debate with somebody uh, about uh, our soteriology, we should go to the book's written in the New Testament concerning soteriology and build our primary uh, uh, premises upon the books that were written with that intent in mind and especially the book of Romans. So uh, let's close at this time and ask the Lord to bless. Lord, we thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you that you gave Paul a time of peace where he could write this in a very calm manner and educate us about what you have done for us that we could be united with you. So we ask that you will bless in our study, bless our students, Father, as now they begin to prepare for our exam on the soteriological books. And then, Father, let us be most comfortable in explaining the circumstances of these four letters as they were written, the purpose of their, they, they were written, the situation that Paul was in as he was writing them, so that we can better convey your intended message. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.